Um, all of this is made possible by the Swanson Fund, so I'd like to thank them again for giving us this opportunity. Um, so tonight's lecturer, Matt Hutchinson, is visiting us from San Francisco. Matt is staying here with us since Tuesday until Saturday, um, and he's doing a fabrication-focused workshop with the architecture department. Um, and we're all very excited to have him here and his generosity and time and help. Um, Matt Hutchinson is a licensed architect, designer, artist, and an exceptional fabricator. Matt's San Francisco-based design and fabrication practice path focuses on design through making, but with diverse interests with which range from object to furniture to architecture to the urban environment. Matt's interests in the potential convergence of traditional technique and digital process inform his own architecture and design practice, where material and fabrication experiments are at the core of his working method. The work evolves through a feedback loop of always moving between design and making, try something, evaluate it, transform it, see it in a new way. This curiosity to explore material properties and processes along with the continual testing of ideas through prototypes reveals new potentials for his design investigations. Matt earned his Bachelor of Architecture at Kent State University and his Master of Architecture from Yale School of Architecture. He, his previous professional design experiences range from Vincent James Associates in Minneapolis, shop architects in New York City, and face design in New York City, among others. Matt is currently faculty at CCA, where he teaches architecture studios. And most recently, he was a fellow at the Autodesk Pier 9 Artist in Residence program, where he pursued design research interests with support from Autodesk and access to their advanced fabrication fa facility. So we'll see some of those today. I'm very excited. And welcome, Matt. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for having me, and thanks for uh, to all of you for making it out, braving the cold. Um, totally not used to this right now in San Francisco. It's about 60 degrees. Um, so, <clears throat> so I've titled the talk "Interface," um, as it seems appropriate to a lot of my work in several ways. Uh, it's a point where two systems, parts, or materials meet and interact. Um, similarly, it uh, could be a surface forming a common boundary between two portions of material, matter, or space. So um, as I get into the work, I think it'll be apparent that uh, much of my interest uh, lies in negotiating between various materials and processes and finding a productive interaction between them. So essentially leveraging uh, this interface in new and interesting ways, at least to me. Um, so exactly where or how that happens uh, has definitely shifted over time and between projects. Uh, so just as the work and interest vary, uh, so do the manners of interface present in the work or process. Uh, before getting into the individual pro uh, projects, though, I think it'll be worthwhile to go over, uh, go through some of these manners of interface. So uh, perhaps the first manner uh, to come to mind and also the most fundamental way in which we shape materials, uh, human and the material. Um, it's definitely worth stating uh, here that to me, human interface with material definitely does not exclude tools. As those machines or tools that we employ uh, to shape materials uh, in our environment have evolved, so too have our relationships with those machines. Um, increasingly complex, but at the same time, I think m ever more seamless, the interaction with these machines has made us uh, rethink long-held notions uh, of what it means to craft as the machines have become extensions really of our own human capabilities. Um, no matter how advanced the machines become though, I think a fundamental understanding of how those machines or tools, think of them as tools, shape materials. Uh, I think it's totally essential to moving beyond sort of the prescribed limitations and uses of those machines. Uh, so 
material to material interface, the place where two or more, to, two or more of these materials come together or converge as um, what we call a detail. I think you can choose to suppress, so conceal or erase your method of joinery between the parts, or you can also choose to express it, reveal, highlight aspects of the construction or assembly. Either is valid. It really just depends on how it might support your overall concept or tectonic. Uh, human and architectural interface. In my case, probably object, as most of my interests uh, are explored at the scale of, of object or furniture. Uh, this could definitely be pretty broad, uh, but for simplicity's sake, I think the way we interact with architecture through movement, spatial experience, uh, and perhaps direct tactile uh, interaction with the physical materials around us in our architecture. Uh, and similarly, on a broader scale, the manner in which architecture or object interfaces within this larger context, the city, the environment, the landscape, history, culture, uh, and so forth. And then lastly, and perhaps the most ambiguous, but I think you know, it's worth thinking about the potential interface between humans and something other. Uh, for example, the sensorium, the, the senses, smell, sound, taste, and so forth. So uh, it's through those uh, manners of interface that I've loosely grouped the work that I'm about to present. Uh, that said, I'm gonna begin uh, the talk 12 years ago in grad school, uh, where I first began explorations um, with di digital tools and processes. Um, exposure um, to the capabilities of, at that time, new software, new processes, for me at least, CNC tools, prompted um, thoughts about new geometric potentials and continuity and seamlessness of surface. The Vice Table, which was a collaboration with a colleague, Mark Hash, was thought of as a sort of topography. A soft depression in the surface became a removable tray for multiple uses. And then transitioning from the cast aluminum tray into the wood surface became the focus of the table. And then consequently, the challenge in the fabrication. So there was a rigor in understanding both the materials and fabrication techniques so well that you could essentially make them do the same exact thing. Uh, the fit, tolerance, and material properties were carefully considered, and understanding the overlap between digital and the hand craft was paramount in fabrication. Things like draft angles and runners were milled right into the match plate for sand casting, and then risers, sprues, and gates were added in by hand. Uh, when you're casting aluminum, it shrinks about 530 seconds of an inch per foot from the form as it cools. So we accounted for this in the digital model, so we oversized it, so when it cooled it was more or less uh, just the right size prior to uh, the final machining. Uh, and then of course, wood being a natural material moves a bit, very little parallel to the grain, but certainly cross grain, which can affect the fit, so enough tolerance has to be built into the system. Each component uh, was either directly fabricated on the CNC mill or indirectly in the casting molds that were made on the CNC. And then the aluminum to wood transition meshed into this virtually seamless tabletop. Uh, the fit changes with the, the humidity a little bit. Uh, the two tables were made at the time, one from walnut and another from mahogany. So several years later, uh, this project, the Stelasso table, was another exploration into surface continuity, which has in this project evolved in, in that it had more control over the formal deformations, and then also in developing a better interface, I think, between the complex non-orthogonal parts. Stelasso comes from Greek, meaning to drip or that which drips. Uh, this single software definition uh, accommodated the generation of surface the deformation, the material thickness, variability and tolerances, and it even calculated in real time the, the cost of the 3D printing. Uh, and then that same definition could be used to generate, as you can see here, any number of configurations and variations with very little preparation for the actual fabrication. So this was designed before choosing, say, the final 
wood for milling and then adjust it on the fly to accommodate the final material thickness, dimensions, et cetera. This uh, se sectional edge overlap revealing the interface and emphasizing the qualities, I think, of the 3D printed ceramic. And then light tool marks uh, from the CNC milling processes that were purposely left uh, as sort of a subtle evidence of the fabrication process. So as we move through more of the projects, I think it'll be obvious that I'm often work, working in, at this small furniture scale, and I think I gravitate towards this uh, as a method to test ideas, whether it's architectural, spatial, material. In many ways, it's more quickly and comprehensive for me than waiting to test them at a larger scale. So I'm always kind of thinking of these small tests uh, as prototypes for maybe a larger conceptual idea or agenda. So more recently, during a fellowship at Autodesk Pier 9 workshop in San Francisco, I was able to work on a number of these types of design research projects with some fantastic resources that they have there. Um, but when I started, it had been actually many years since I had used a, a CNC machine, so I wanted to get familiar with some of the machines and also get into the CAM programming, so that's the method uh, for instructing the machine how to perform any number of the operations. So these uh, first initial projects uh, from the Geode series were really just conceived as a way to get more familiar with the machines. In this case, the Haas uh, VF2, which is this really powerful, just a basic three-axis mill. But they also ended up turning into productive explorations in their own right synthesizing and evolving some of the interests uh, from the previous projects, uh, modulation of that surface uh, continuity, so um, playing on that. Again, I think even yet more, more pr precise control of those geometries, and then further refinement of the joinery or fit, or in this case, sort of a nesting uh, between very complex uh, three-dimensional geometric parts. So testing similar ideas in other materials and in different proportions using different parameters. I think there's this interesting juxtaposition in these between this, uh, what appears to be a stock or rectilinear ex exterior and the surprisingly freeform interior. Uh, the only hints that you get of that interior space are through these oddly spaced apertures. So in the walnut uh, tool marks were left on the interior, uh, while in aluminum, the step overs or the amount that the machine is moving uh, were so small, uh, so as to leave the emphasis on the reflectivity and continuity of that interior surface. So uh, these really basic exercises or tests provided the basis for the machine to material, and the software feedback loop, um, and the workflow that later informed aspects of a few other projects, such as uh, this, the Caldera table, which is the last, last table, I promise. Um, it synthesized and again, and again advanced several of the ideas from those previous tables and studies, continuity of surface, but over multiple materials, uh, but I think allowing for a greater depth uh, within or beneath the surface. Uh, tighter technical control of the fit and the geometries, and I think sort of a, an interior and exterior dialogue. The, the depth and the proportions of the table necessitated uh, strategic glue up of stock material so that we, I'm only machining wood where it's needed, so it's not wasteful, and then correspondingly uh, requires a careful machining strategy. Uh, involved really tight tolerances, machining of uh, both a top and a bottom. And because, because of that sort of creative ways to do the work holding or securing the part, once it had been machined on one side, you have to flip it over so it becomes difficult to clamp down because of the irregular geometries. Uh, so here's one of the rough, roughing steps early in that process on the top and then roughing passes on the underside. The setup, the milling, the cleanup for just this portion of the project took about 10 hours total in a straight run. And then it all came together for the finished surface. 
uh, but this was only part of the intended exploration. The other aspect, and probably the more difficult, due to the freeform geometry and extremely tight tolerances, were these strange sort of lids that I had designed. Uh, unsuccessful tests in wood uh, prompted considerations in another material. Um, so for the needed precision, I was able to leverage the capabilities of the Haas CNC mill um, when machining to much more complex uh, geometry and tolerances. So you can, unfortunately the sound's not working, it's pretty uh, impressive, but you can get a sense here of the speed and power. It's cutting through solid two inch aluminum in this. And then the forms of those lids emerging from the aluminum stock, the roughing passes on the bottom and then some of the finished passes above. And since they are two-sided pieces, they have to be held in place uh, as they become free from the milling. So strategically placed tabs um, work pretty well. And then very tight step overs were around 15 thousandths of an inch, which is mostly unnoticeable even, even to the touch. And then they parted out with too much trouble uh, with some pneumatic hand tools. It's worth noting, I think, um, that even with the incredible precision and control of machines like that, um, many times, especially with these non-standard geometries, uh, success really comes down to uh, manual skill and craft at very critical points in the process. But once the lids were clear anodized, they obtained a sort of a softness that muted reflection, and they sit nicely within the walnut. I think they're fairly interesting objects in their own right. So those lids, um, they have a, an ambiguity, I think, that invites play and the, with the, the fit and the placement uh, in the depressions. And then discovery as they're flipped over to become trays. So overall, a very challenging, cha challenging and fun project where I felt like the design and the detailing of these non-standard complex forms, um, how they interfaced, they all came together with a, with a decent degree of resolution. So I think it worked out. So a relatively quick sort of side exploration, um, which is still ongoing to me, I think in certain ways, uh, that arose from doing all these CNC-based projects. Um, that was this project mach machine inscriptions. So I think typically uh, the CNC programmed tool pathing or the way it's, it's removing material. Uh, it's aimed at removing material in the quickest or the most efficient way. Um, aspects that are really essential when you're trying to streamline workflow and machine parts in a production environment. Um, and it also allows for extremely high levels of finish uh, on a range of complicated parts, even surfaces with complex curvature. So I think these studies were aimed at uh, examining tool pathing for possible other attributes to uncover uh, innate qualities in the various paths or bring new readings uh, through exp expressive patterns and textures. Uh, these studies looked at several techniques such as drilling operations shown here, uh, contouring, hatching, and so forth, specifically to leverage the, uh, the capa uh, qualities, I should say, of aluminum. So jumping scale from the furniture uh, to a, a million square foot um, project, uh, a competition, uh, the 2011 Burnham Prize uh, McCormick Place Redux. So it was an ideas competition that sought to launch a debate uh, over the future of this expo center in Chicago, which really embodied the modernist dream of this uh, expansive column-free interior spaces. It was designed by Jean uh, Summers, who was a protege of Mies van der Rohe. And it was built on parkland that was really meant to remain open and free to the public. So it was considered really an eyesore by many, and it was also outmoded from its original use. So the competition itself was largely open and vague, and it simply asked, what are some alternate visions uh, for a resolution as, sim as opposed to simply tearing carrying this unique piece of architecture down. So our proposal 
uh, orto and herbs or garden in the city intends to merge that modern relic with the surrounding landscape. So when Chicago adopted the motto herbs and horto or city in a garden in 1837, it was uh, quite a different place from the city that exists today. The city then existed within this pristine landscape of expansive prairie on a vast lake. But the city's rapid and expansive growth sort of inverted that relationship. The city has overtaken and enveloped those natures. So Orto and Herbs begins with that observation that the garden no longer surrounds the city, but exists as this network taking on multiple forms throughout it. Uh, and it looked to extend that network and, and further the notion of garden in the city by creating new relationships between various landscapes architecture and people, this project amplifies interactions with nature and pr promotes new forms of leisure. Each strata of the building, roof, surface, plenum space, and plinth all became distinct architectural environments. And then the building itself, uh, the idea was a garden vitrine of urban leisure activity integrated alongside the lakeshore continuum. So once seen as a discrete object sort of lodged in the landscape there, McCormick Place is now acting as a flexible framework for synthesizing natural habitat with this architectural ambition. By stratifying park passage and circulation through that rationalist box, what was once a looming mass uh, no longer interrupts the lakeshore experience but becomes this intriguing new environment to explore. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the work is done at this smaller hands-on scale. One area that I find particularly productive to experiment in or with is that of lighting. Uh, it offers an opportunity to test novel forms uh, and geometries, fabrication strategies, um, emerging or experimental materials, and new material processes and effects. So this was an early uh, light lighting experiment. The clove lamp uh, developed for an architectural office reception area. The design of the piece was conceived as a fully parametric model or process, meaning all of the geometry the, and parameters that controlled that were for fully customizable. So from the specific proportions of the lamp to the articulation and modulation of that lamp form to a more global morphology, and then even to the fabrication layouts, the labeling, and so forth. This was all contained within sort of a single um, parametric model. So in addition to the visual effects resulting from the formal undulations, uh, the the painting of the narrow edges gives the lamps a subtle color gradient that emphasizes the form even more. That lamp has gone through both prototype and small runs, so it's definitely served as a, a successful proof of concept for me. Lamella lamp was developed as an alternate <laughs> option when I was designing the clove lamp in the design phase uh, or the schematic phase, So, uh, but I went ahead and made an uh, prototype and subsequently uh, several more variations. But rather than having full contro control over every single piece, uh, this design relies on digitally cut top and bottom plate, which, which registers individual strips of thin veneer wood. And then the natural materials, material properties give resistance to that twisting. So that results in that subtle overall torquing of the entire lamp. And then variations in the amount of twist designed into the digital model to create this visibility gradient as you move around the piece. Like a lot of these projects, uh, the Ben series lamps, they try and strike this balance, I think, between both analog and digital um, production. These, one, these particular lights try to uh, achieve a visual thinness and a functional simplicity with really a minimal of means. So, only using a single piece of half inch tubing, uh, steel, stainless, or brass, both the desk and floor lamp incorporate four and five bends respectively. 
to give structure to and form to the lamp. And then the tube, the tube bending itself is first visualized precisely digitally, and then it's designed around readily available die sets for simple manual um, bending and ease of repeatability. And then the shades are 3D printed from flexible nylon material that are easily removable, replaceable. You just print a new one if um, you lose or break one of them. Here's just a few uh, of many, many iterations of hole patterning and densities. So over time, I've developed a number of shades, bits, and recently prototypes in brass, shown here with a polished finish. This part's actually first printed uh, in wax and then through the lost wax process, cast in brass and then hand polished. I really, I find the, the relationship uh, between the craft and sort of the inherent risk of working with natural materials and then the control and pre precision of the digital fabrication methods as a, as a really potent one. I think digital fabrication personally for me can have quite predictable results. So when you combine that with processes where the results are less certain, I think it can be a little more compelling. Uh, the digitally cut rings and armatures of this series, the strand series, just sort of provide a, a guide for this otherwise unwieldy wood slats. In the case of this lamp, uh, steam bent strands were actually waste or offcut from another, from other couple other projects. So just trying to come up with a project for the waste. Uh, the behavior of the, the individual strands can't really be modeled or um, only approximated in the computer. So ultimately the resulting curvatures that you see here and idiosyncrasies of the, the way that individual pieces want to bend and twist, you have to sort of embrace that. And then another prototype piece a small room divider or visual screen leveraged uh, the twisting capacity of very thinly sliced walnut slats to modulate visibility, light, shadow, and depth. And those prototype pieces actually led to this commission for uh, a chandelier, and this was done with quarter inch steamed beech strands. Again, combined with laser cut profiles and again, because of the nature of that material, the pieces rely more on developing a working technique than the precision of the digitally cut profile ribs. So as a result, they're actually extremely time intensive. I think sometimes people make the assumption that digital fabrication is quick and easy, and it's not really the case. The finished piece is just over four foot long, and extremely lightweight, as you might expect. So another interest of mine has to do with assembly, because simply the, the fact that architecture is seldom, if ever, homogenous. It's generally composed of many diverse and disparate materials uh, that come together in complementary ways. Bioluminescence is a play on words that refers to bioluminescence, the phenomenon where living organisms produce and emit their own light. So this was one of 10 site-specific installations commissioned um, by the New, or New Orleans AIA, part of their decor uh, annual art and architecture event in December of 2011. This was a collaboration with Igor Sadiki, who was actually visited here last year, uh, principal of IS Studio. So this was sited at the end of a dark residential alley in the Marini neighborhood. And the idea was that it invited passersby to cross over the otherwise implied boundary uh, between the public sidewalk and the, the private space beyond that. The installation is composed of two conjoined forms. One, uh, the shorter one that embraces this viewing from the outside and the other, which is to be walked into and experienced from the interior. And then the overall conjoined volume suggests that maybe it's part of a larger cellular condition or 
potentially part of a, of a more expansive system. So here's some early ornamental patterning studies and materials testing that we were doing. Structurally, the volume uses the tension between the rubber surface, which was a translucent urethane rubber, and then a curved steel framing system to really accurately model the panel forms. We used a physics engine uh, within uh, our software to basically take this doubly curved surface and relax it into a flat panel um, that was usable for our own purposes of, of milling and casting. Um, and this was critical because the urethane had a very limited capacity for stretching, so we couldn't undersize it greatly and just expect it to stretch into place. We had to have a very precise um, impression of what that, that panel would be. In terms of fabrication details, incorporating self jigging and aligning components, which you'll see in the next slide, uh, made assembly for this fairly complex uh, form, relatively straightforward. And then integrated connections, loops and ties, which you can kind of see here, they're cast directly into the panels. And that served to reduce the overall number of separate pieces and components and trying to keep a consistent tectonic throughout the entire piece. So here's some of these uh, self-registering joints and details, which let me essentially fabricate the whole structure without having to measure anything or determine any angles. Um, I just made full-scale plots uh, to roll, uh, roll bend the, the tubes to as templates. And then while I was actually fabricating the structure in San Francisco, Igor was milling molds and actually first cast a test panel in Texas so he could send it to me to stretch in place. And then when I found that the tolerance was too generous, that it was just too tight, we adjusted the overall, uh, the final pieces accordingly prior to milling. So some of the interior shots, you can see the loops and then the ties cast right into the, right into the panels that became the way, uh, the method for attachment. And then this is just a layout of the workflow, more or less. So initial geometry, the extracted wireframe, uh, pieces for laser cutting, the structural framework, panel profiles, optimized profiles, and so on. And all of this was completed in a really quick time frame in about two to two and a half months. And then it was, obviously it was complicated by the fact that we're working from two locations uh, and then it installed in the third. So shipping times and uh, shipping constraints were definitely considered and really affected the, the overall scale. In the end, it worked out pretty well. Um, it was interesting to see how people engaged the project as the piece itself was a little bit ambiguous. Um, people really seemed to respond to the tactility and they were much more sort of haptic in their exploration of it than we anticipated. So many of these material materials and fabrication-based experimental projects like these have found their way into some of the electives uh, I've taught at California College of the Arts. Um, in this course, uh, material assemblage from a few years ago, students explored a number of material processes as they related to both digital and traditional uh, production techniques. So they explored a wide range of materials and processes such as this sort of hybrid system combining flexible and rigid materials. Uh, here, uh, steam bending with digital milling and shaping of the slats. Uh, modular variation through a customizable uh, single mold uh, for casting concrete. Some students were interested in uh, testing the strength of composites such as carbon fiber and others digital kerf cutting plywood for bendability and flexibility with integral, integral joinery. So really a, a broad range of explorations with uh, real materials and processes to test out maybe bigger ideas perhaps. Restock is a series of ongoing research and design uh, projects really, which look to exploit uh, the potential of coupling the efficiencies of off the stock 
uh, or I'm sorry, off-the-shelf off uh, standard stock sections with the adaptability of parametric design and digital fabrication, and really to specifically leverage the emerging technology of rapid proto prototype metal parts uh, as actual finished architectural components, perhaps. I think the, the potentials for this type of system are many, as it's reconfigurable, it's scalable, highly customizable. So, for example, it could be the structure of a piece of furniture, I think, almost as easily as it could be framework for a, a, a curtain wall. This was a, a taxonomy of several joint types, prototyped with standard aluminum, wood, and steel uh, sections that are readily available. Uh, in the exploration of ways to create viable connections, I was also looking at uh, traditional joinery techniques, such as this Japanese it's a cross stub tenon joint, and evolving and adapting them to be incorporated with digital processes. So here's a, a hybrid of simple off-the-shelf pre-made dowels with a 3D printed no joint. So th for that particular joint, I developed a number of jigs to accurately cut the interface simply and efficiently just on a, on a table saw, getting repeatable and surprisingly accurate uh, notches. So once again, you can see the analog or handcraft is needed in what might be termed a digital fabrication project. Um, that, that was the easy part. Actually, in this case, most of the effort went into developing a parametric system and solving geometric issues, which in the case of uh, this freestanding space frame was, was optimized so that each node uh, or shoulder was only as long as it had to be in order to accommodate the, the way the, the struts came together. So the, the, the tighter the angle uh, between the neighboring struts meant that the shoulders would have to be longer so that the, the walnut dowels wouldn't intersect. And then as the, the, the angles became larger, it meant the shoulders could be minimized to save on 3D printed material and, and printing time. So like I said, while I'm interested in the flexibility of those types of systems, I'm also interested in the potential of 3D printing as an end product, uh, not just to stand in for another, another material. Uh, especially, I think, as the potential for real usable metal parts becomes a lot more feasible um, in cost and time. In this case, this is stainless steel infused with bronze. Um, it's weldable, it's tappable, it's machinable and it's legitimately usable, I think, as a finished material. So with the parametri parametric system, again, the only measurements I'm making are to, to cut the strut lengths on a standard cold saw, and then otherwise all the, the pieces just pop together in the right order, and they're plug welded together in about 10 or 15 minutes. So I think the stool was an exercise in geometric freedom, and then a test for the usability of the 3D printed metal. Um, again, uh, I think what's interesting is that uh, the, the potential for larger systems and the ease of fabrication and assembly that's scalable from furniture to larger architectural components. But first, shifting to another set of machining processes, this was an exploration that began with sort of modest aspirations. I just wanted to make a simple shop stool uh, out of aluminum, but it ended up pushing the capabilities of uh, a five-axis water jet cutter. Since I've built and assembled so many things over the years, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to put things together in smarter ways. So I found myself, again, looking at these various these, uh, books about joinery techniques. And so what was initially this quick shop stool turned into this exploration of the full five axis capabilities of uh, the OMAX, with, which is a, a kind of water jet cutter, to cut not just, not just flat 2D profiles, but to tilt for beveled and angled cuts that would be intrinsic to the design and detailing of the project. So that particular machine had a maximum tilt on the head of 59.9 degrees. So knowing that, I could design these intersection details to not only work within those limits, but 
in doing so, you know, creating a design, uh, uh, creating details that are truly unique to that process, uh, such as these um, angled countersinks, a, a detail that uh, is likely you could only produce on that type of machine. Uh, and again, missing the sound, um, a water jet uses a, a, a very high pressure, thin stream of water, uh, uh, 60,000 PSI. Um, with uh, an added uh, abrasive, in this case garnet, uh, very fine abrasive material. And so it pierces through materials like four inch thick steel um, uh, with relative ease. The thicker the material, the slower it cuts. But you can see there, that was the actual cutting of uh, the, that elliptical conical intersection. So very little work after the cutting. Uh, although all hand work and craft, once again, uh, using the edges, the files, a uh, small round over bit for the, for the seat, and then tapping the threads. Um, so an angled hole had to be cut to the diameter of the trap tap drill size. And again, not a detail that you probably couldn't do by hand or uh, any other means really easily. And then assembly is a really straightforward and simple process. There's just four pieces plus hardware, and the pieces essentially self-align. So the assembly is super intuitive. Here's the underside showing the, the Allen nuts that tension uh, the seat down to the legs, and then the top side of that same detail showing a, a split uh, countersink tenon detail. So since that first prototype that I made there, I've gone on to produce uh, a round of variations of the type, uh, size and shape, as well as a small production run, testing out the feasibility of this uh, for outsourcing and cutting uh, and really the overall manufacturability of it. The ideas from that project provided the basis for this exhibition entry, Obliqua, uh, which was an otherwise useless object for the Secret Life of Buildings Symposium at UT Austin earlier uh, just last year. So oblique geometries and intersections, off kilter angles uh, and strange details, I think belie the fact that it's just three pieces of aluminum uh, and six cap screws. And then it incorporates variations uh, of the oblique tenon stool, but uh, pushes them a little further, amplifies them making them a little bit more legible and pronounced, I think, and at the same time, a little certainly stranger. And then a recent competition proposal with Adam Marcus of Variable Projects became a, a way to test some of that research from restock and then the, also the five axis um, cutting projects by expanding the scope uh, and exploring alternative ways for making or assembling architecture. The Cloud9 proposal was designed for an empty side lot along the Embarcadero, which runs along the water in San Francisco. Um, it was a stainless steel cloud uh, that takes advantages of the site's solar exposure and produces this uh, shifting field of shadows uh, for pedestrians to experience from below. Uh, it was designed to be fabricated from, again, from stock stainless steel components and then parametric joints were cut from stainless uh, steel plate on a five axis water jet cutter. And then the joints themselves were optimized for ease of welding and assembly. Um, and the process was designed that it was to be self-registering, self-jigging uh, right with the tube members. The installation itself uh, was designed to be embedded with sort of data in the form of water jet cut perforations uh, that communicate text via Morse code patterns. Uh, so throughout the day, sun projecting down to the plaza below where pedestrians hanging out beneath, sort of knowingly or not, were immersed in this cl cloud of information. And then at night, um, the cloud lit from below with LED lights, um, providing an entirely different atmosphere than during the day, meant to evoke the San Francisco fog. So architectural uh, a 
assembly, or rather disassembly in this case, was the main focus for another ideas competition, uh, round bid building reuse, which asked designers to imagine new potentials for simply for just the, the cast concrete brise of the American Federal Building um, in Orlando that was built in 1963. So by first reducing the, the 120 super panels that made up the, the brise uh, down into more elemental components, basic trapezoidal panels, the project looked to further the relationship um, permeability with uh, the immediate surroundings and extend uh, more integrally or directly into the natural landscape. So the Lake Eola, the site, uh, the chosen site, provided a setting to reassemble those panels into this new construction. It was a uh, fluid assembly that uh, was meant to mediate between the, the paths, the shoreline, the lake, and the sky. And then the rolling over hanging panels became a backdrop for urban recreation, leisure, and basic habitat. The reconstructed assembly lends itself to new interpretations functionally, as well as new experiences viscerally. Uh, the panel, panels extend in groupings from the lake shore out into the water as a rock garden that offers shade and protection to plant and animal life. And then sort of individual panels scattered along the path become places to rest and view the lake and maybe watch climbers scale the overhanging crenellations. And then along with time, water level reflections, plant life propagation, the new formation uh, is always sort of changing. In thinking about architectural assembly, uh, materials coming together all around us, interacting by way of joints, overlaps, reveals, and so forth. In their simplest form, those intersections are revealed as a, a, a single line. So uh, these studies use the interface between two parts of a single material uh, as a locus for various expressions of a single line joint. In this case, from 3 16 inch uh, steel plate, modulations in the line, either stitching or zigzagging, et cetera, can give assorted functionality to those parts from uh, sliding to latching uh, to interlocking and then adding multiple layers uh, and additional fastening options become possible, which is taking pieces like that and making sort of complex uh, three-dimensional assemblies held together with a single fastener. So those studies aren't meant to be really practical solutions to any problem, but uh, speculations on the relationship between expression and functionality of a joint, which is what we're having the students do in the workshop here. Uh, in parallel to those studies, I was teaching a course at CCA called Prototyping Steel, which is aimed to give the students a better understanding of the material properties and the associated fabrication processes through research, lectures, and chat tours, and then mostly hands-on making exercises uh, like welding, cutting, drilling, capping, um, as well as getting to experiment uh, with industrial digital techniques or processes such as the water jet cutting and incorporating those back into the, into the process. So then students could implement the, what they had learned and get further insight uh, through the design and fabrication of actual full-scale prototypes. So here a team of students were interested in bending and folding a plate to simultaneously make up this three-dimensional tread and then the stanchion portion of the, of the stair and then also straddling and attaching to the stringer. Um, another team was interested in designing a modular stair system with uh, integral self-registering tabs in the stringers. Uh, so I don't really view these as like vocational. I think the purpose isn't to turn students into skilled craftsmen in, in only a semester. <laughs> Though every bit of experience definitely helps when you're learning those tacit skills. The ambition is really that students come away from the course 
with a working knowledge of practical details and more importantly, an intuitive sensibility when they're uh, about designing with steel, when they're out, out in the real world. So, okay, shifting from physical interface uh, to that which denies it, or at least attempts to deny uh, spatial definition. This was conceived and designed with Brian Price of Price Studio for an invited exhibition. Uh, the five by five participa participatory provocations and blind spots was our speculation on what a, a field office for the NSA, the National Security Agency might be. So the, the, the ubiquitous sort of Main Street downtown intersection with its pastiche of architectural styles became the site for our hypothetical intervention. So operating under the premise that when surveillance and social media become indistinguishable, the NSA could be understood not as an adversary, but a public utility. The NSA branch offices simultaneously provide privacy and voyeurism in a state state sanctioned space outside of the NSA's ubiquitous surveillance coverage. A double-sided wall, a border, uh, frames the void, a void in the city that absorbs light and spatial definition. And then within that blind spot, the idea was one had direct access to an underground server containing the NSA's vast rep repository of data. The, the branch offices are an empty monument to the social contract that implies that in exchange for access, one becomes complicit with the NSA and thus making uh, material our dilemma of security and narcissism. Okay, from that slightly dystopian project to one that centers around a decidedly more optimistic subject and one uh, more suitable to end the talk on, that of beer. As, as craft beer continues to evolve, I think um, styles that were at one time precisely identifiable by very distinct characteristics have strayed from those origins, right? So right now there's an emerging culture of experimentation that's taking ex beer styles into exciting and unfamiliar territory. Unfortunately, uh, the existing glassware types, these familiar and ubiquitous profiles, I'm sure we all know, have remained largely unchanged and have yet to go any sort of sim similar explorations. So other vessels considers the experimental nature of craft beer and it takes an empirical approach in the creation of uh, new types of complementary vessels so using those classical typologies as a point of departure, uh, other vessels plays on the qualities and traits, and color, depth, uh, turbidity, aroma of certain beers through incisive, yet hopefully playful manipulations of form with various aesthetic, tactile, and olfactory ambitions. So this project uh, le leverages uh, CAM and CNC machining for the ease of adaptability and then the rapid manufacturing of molds in the production of relatively small run uh, bespoke uh, drinking vessels. So the, the precision made molds coupled with the skill and craft of glass blowing allow for both the, I think the overall clarity and control of the forms themselves, but also the distinct distinctive qualities of hand-blown glass. And this, uh, these first prototype molds served as a quick way to test the feasibility uh, of the CNC milled aluminum for short run custom uh, glasses and for, for, uh, for me to work with the glass blower to, to really to test the, the geometry and if this was going to, to work uh, for him. So parameters that include mold precision, the ease of use of those molds, uh, different surface texture and geometry uh, have been fairly successful and informed what will become uh, the next 
sets of molds. So it's currently a work in progress, and I'm really looking forward to seeing these, seeing this particular project move forward. Uh, so until then, cheers and thanks for having me.